Good evening and welcome. My name is May Nye. I'm a professor of Asian American Studies and History and co-director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia, the main sponsor for tonight's event to celebrate Mabel Pinkhua Lee, and I will be your host this evening. Mabel Lee was an extraordinary Chinese American woman, a feminist and activist for women's equality and the vote in both the United States and in China, a scholar and a church leader. Our celebration this evening is on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of her PhD from Columbia, but it's also an occasion to celebrate her many faceted talents and achievements and to learn about her life and times. Before we begin our program, a brief word about the current situation at Columbia, which involves a strike by the Student Workers Union of, the, of Columbia now in its second week. The union represents mostly our PhD graduate students who are employed as teaching assistants and research assistants, but also includes master students and some college students. At the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, we support the right of all workers to unionize, to a collective bargaining agreement, and the right to strike in pursuit of a fair contract. Our professors are respecting the strike by not performing replacement labor for our graduate students, uh, workers who are on strike. Mabel Lee herself was an activist who dedicated her own life's work to equal rights. And so we hold this event in the spirit of solidarity with social activism. Thank you to our co-sponsors, the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center, the Weatherhead East Asia Institute, Columbia's Institute for the Study of Sexuality and Gender, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Barnard, the Department of Economics and the Department of Political Science. And a special thank you to Professor Denise Cruz, Professor Rebecca Jordan-Young, Josephine Capito, Caputo, I'm sorry, and Shayla Alam and Alan Joe, our student workers at CSER, and Kay Jang, our webinar host at Heyman. We have a rich program for you tonight. We'll last a little bit, uh, about an hour or so. And we welcome you to put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time. I'm gonna introduce all of our speakers all at once. So then once our program starts, we can proceed uh, one by one. Uh, we will start with Robert G and Reverend Bayer Lee of the First Baptist Ch Church in Chinatown. Robert G is a trustee of the church and Reverend Lee is its pastor. He has served there since 2004. Pastor Lee is also a scholar, a postdoctoral fellow at the Elvinwood Center of Teachers College of Columbia, where he is a researcher in Hakka and Taishan ethnographic studies. And he also has a background in architecture. Mr. G will introduce Pastor Lee with a short slideshow. Our next speaker is Suresh Naidu. He's professor of international and public affairs and economics. His field is in development economics, labor economics, and political economy. He holds a PhD from Berkeley, and he has been with us at Columbia since 2016. Next, we will have Kathleen Cahill, an associate professor of history at Penn State University, who received her PhD from the University of Chicago, and which is where I know her from. Professor Cahill is a social historian who explores the everyday experiences of ordinary people, primarily women. She focuses on women's working and political lives, and she's also interested in the connections generated by women's movements. She's author of the award-winning book, Federal Fathers and Mothers, A Social History of the United States Indian Service, uh, 2011, and last year's Recasting the Vote, How Women of Color Transformed the Suffrage Movement, uh, published on the occasion of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. That book explores the role of indigenous, African-American, Hispano, and Chinese-American suffragists, including Mabel Lee. Next, we will have Madeline Shu, professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Shu holds a PhD from Yale, and at UT, she was director of the Center for Asian American Studies for eight years. She's also been president of the Immigration and Ethnic History Society. Her first book, Dreaming of Gold, Dreaming of Home, Transnationalism and Migration Between the U.S. and China, uh, published in 2000, was a pathbreaking work that was one of the very first uh, it, in the field to reconsider immigration history from a transnational perspective. Her most recent monograph is the multiple award-winning The Good Immigrants, How the Yellow Peril Became the Model Minority. 
And we will wrap up with a presentation from three students at Barnard. Um, thanks very much to Professor uh, Jordan Young for helping organize this. Three amazing students have prepared a presentation um, about students of color at Barnard. Eleanor Yosef is a senior majoring in women's gender and sexuality studies. And she's also a first year student in the master's program of public health at Mailman. Sulby Lim is a senior at Barnard, majoring also in women, gender, and sexuality studies mm -hmm. and history. And Kayla Legrand is a mm -hmm. senior at Barnard, majoring in women's gender and sexuality studies. So now I bring you Robert G, live from the First Baptist Church in Chinatown at 21 Pell Street. Thank you, Mr. G. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Nye, for introducing us and um, you know we have an esteemed list of uh, colleagues that will be speaking this evening and uh, we're very proud to be broadcasting from the chapel of this very historic church uh, at the first Chinese Baptist Church locally located here in Chinatown on 21 Pell Street so we invite you down anytime so just make an appointment come on down we'll share more over the next 10 minutes uh, Pastor Bailey and I will share some really interesting things about the history of Dr. Mabel Lee. And the church congregation is very proud and honored to participate in the centennial anniversary. But before uh, we get into these wonderful photos and explanation, I'd like to thank our young archivists of teams of Libby Lang, Billy Lang, Ethan Lin, who's made this all possible. And we have a lot more to share with Professor Nye and the Columbia Associates um, down the line. So let's just get started. Uh, Kay, if you can change the next slide. The first slide shows are the wonderful uh, um, academic um, history that she's had uh, starting from, we've uh, posted her high school diplomas from Arathmus High School, uh, where she got very active in the whole suffrage movement. Pastor Lee will share with you about that. Then she had her undergraduate degree from uh, Barnard College, and then her master's from Teachers College, and why we're here today for her 100th anniversary of graduating with a PhD from Columbia University. Next slide, please. As you can see from these photos here that we dug up from Dr. Mabley's personal effects in her archives is a photo of the class of uh, 1916 at Barnard. Next slide, please. And some of the photos at Columbia University as she had uh, spent many of her years uh, during her master's time and during her PhD right there with a photo of the alma mater. Next slide, please. So as you can see, Dr. Mabel Lee was destined for an amazing career and she was um, headed towards China. But in 1924, her dad had unexpectedly passed away, Reverend Li Tao, who right here, we have a plaque honoring Reverend Li Tao. And when he passed away unexpected uh, in 1924, Mabel Lee, Dr. Mabel Lee had dropped her dreams and her passion to keep her dad's vision going. So that's why she went to 13 Doya, where she was the director of the program. And she worked to continue the mission of helping, helping young immigrants learn English and assimilate to life in America. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. And you, you saw from the previous slide that I had circled the photo, and there was Dr. Mabel Lee. She was um, presenting and teaching this. Um, hundreds of students that she had throughout the year. This is a photo side by side of 13 Doria Street of where it happens if you come to the heart of Chinatown of Doria Street, as many of the tourist folks talk about the bloody angle. This is not about the bloody angle, it's about what the Reverend Lee Tao and Dr. Mabel Lee had contributed to Chinatown. And they helped a lot of the immigrants throughout the year. And that side by side comparison of what it looks like today. Next slide, please. And then shortly after raising money, even during the depression, it was a difficult task, but Dr. Mabel Lee worked closely with many of the donors to have this building that we stand in right now today. 
It was originally a five-story walk-up. She had a gut renovated. And what you basically have now is almost everything you see from 95 years ago. And uh, all of the other things that we put in here is a new air conditioning, LED lights, and a new coat of paint. So her presence of her and Reverend Lee's mission and vision is well, very well alive today. Next, and the photos that you see here are uh, photos of her starting one of the first uh, kindergartens in Chinatown, Girl Scouts, and continuing throughout the years and really reaching out to the community and working with young children as well as immigrants. Next slide, kids. So you see a side-by-side -side comparison. We are doing basically the same thing and that passion is still alive today. From 1936, when the building was gut renovated to where we are today, and for the first time in our uh, church's history, we brought our passion and outreach to the community outside. And we had street fairs uh, where we co-branded with Think Chinatown with Amy Chen, who's a graduate of Barnard College. So uh, we are keeping that mission and vision alive. So thank you, Amy Chen from Think Chinatown. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. And so if you do a side-by-side -side comparison, of a 1936 Christmas photo. We're still filling the chapel here, chapter, chapel here on 21 Pell Street and um, doing the things that meant everything to Reverend Lee Tao and Dr. Mabel Lee. And on the bottom photo that you see with the red and blue t-shirts, those are the summer camp programs where we mentor students with uh, the best and brightest, and many of the uh, program directors were from Barnard in Columbia that helped us start the program 36 years ago. So we're very proud of what we do in helping the community. Next slide, please. So most recently in 2018, with all these wonderful things of Dr. Mambley's achievements, both academically and professionally, she was recognized as a woman suffragette on the floor of Congress, where it enacted the law of renaming the post office, of uh, the Chinatown Post Office on Doris Street, called the Mabel Lee Post Office. So if you're gonna mail a letter to us, call it 21 Pell Street, Mabel Lee Post Office Station, New York, New York, 10013. She was recognized with Nidia Velasquez right here on the stage, and we're very proud of her accomplishments. Um, one of the reasons why I'm here is that I'm a, I benefited from Dr. Mabel Lee. I met her and um, she was great. She started the first uh, kindergarten as I mentioned. And then she also helped work with young men to assimilate to life in America. And in fact, this young man at age 15 is my dad in 1937. <laughs> so as you can see, um, She's done a lot of great things, and I'd like to pass the ball over to Pastor Lee to share the details of the story. So sorry about taking up more than two minutes, Pastor Lee. Thank you, Pastor Lee. You're okay. up next. Share screen. We are pretty complicated uh, individuals. Uh, life's uh, cycle uh, appear that uh, we move on and sometimes we uh, even contradict ourselves. So today uh, I would like to look at uh, the time that she spent at the university. Wow, from 1913 to not only uh, 1921 when she finished her dissertation, but all the way to 19... 30s before the war broke out. So five areas we can look at. First, uh, she was four when she left uh, Nanhai, and she was a Mui Jai. So we look, we could look into that whole theory about women and children um, being part of a home. Uh, during her high school year, uh, she was a high achiever. Uh, much has been written about the time she was engaged in women's suffrage. Uh, in the early uh, spring, in the spring of uh, 1912. So I wanted to uh, spend some time looking at her time at Columbia and then other uh, 
other uh, area in terms of uh, her missionary work. And lastly, uh, we touch on how did she make her money? She, uh, she studied economics, so very quickly. This is uh, picture number one that we're gonna look at. Picture number two, this is from uh, Barnard College, probably 1913. Uh, picture number three, took me a long time to find out this is actually on a campus of Cornell. What was the occasion? One of the way I want to look at photograph is that who really organized it? Who funded it? What was the motive? What was the agenda? Why is an individual in the center versus in the periphery or the margin? Uh, fourth is a picture of Mabel right in the middle again. Who put her there? Who are these people around her? And then the last picture, this is in 1959. She again is in the middle surrounded by men. So the first picture is an odd picture whereby she uh, stand above the parents, somewhat subservient to her. Well, this picture was used to uh, promote the women's suffrage movement where the father is in fact cut out. And she was placed in the center as a Chinese woman, missing uh, African-Americans who were supposed to be part of this movement. This is a picture of her when she began her career as an academic. First time she encountered many Chinese. So her, her, her thinking has somewhat switched to look at herself as really Chinese rather than an immigrant. And so she began to identify with these students from China. Uh, and more importantly, how about the thinking? So in her essay, Chinese Submerged Half, she pleaded for a wider sphere of usefulness for long submerged women in China. I asked for our girls to open door to the treasure of knowledge. The same opportunities for physical development as boys, and the same right of participation in all human activity. Curiously, she mentioned Ran Shihai, which in history has been a villain who have ambition of wanting to become an emperor, to go backward in terms of democracy. But yet, uh, the character Yan Shihai is rather complex. So I had problem reconciling the fact that she was a feminist, yet promoted a so-called ambitious tyrant to be. And here his name is mentioned in a way that he was able to uh, associate with foreign diplomat. Um, the next, uh, is this picture of a huge gathering up in Cornell, probably around 1915, funded by none other than Yan Shihai. He was a reformer. He wanted to promote education. And part of the uh, funding from the Boxer Rebellion Demony Fund supported so many of these students. So he was really a rock star. Within this picture, very interestingly, you see the character and one appear is this gentleman who is a minister with a mustache, handlebar mustache. He wrote a book called Reminiscent that's been used by uh, Professor Gordon uh, Chan at uh, Stanford and also the book on the uh, Chinatown trunk mystery because he's the only English speaking Chinese who recorded in writing in English from his book Reminiscent about the life of Chinese men now he has uh, uh, six daughters, two of whom were here with Mabel, uh, Louise and Carolyn. And then on the left, look like he was not a happy camper, is none other than Hu Xi. And to look into the life of uh, Reverend Hui Kin, turned out that he had six daughters and 10 sons. And he was able to orchestrate meetings with her daughters, with these overseas Chinese scholar in which six of them, all six marry scholars. These are individuals that's very involved 
uh, the student movement, very involved in the uh, May 4th. And we did a study about that when we celebrate. So if you're interested, look further. And again, May Boo's in the center. Why? Well, she won the oration contest at Amherst in 1914, in which a title true patriotism, Chinese patriotism, very different from the patriotism that we know. Again, Yan Shi Hai was mentioned as a hero. And she basically talked about two, two things that every Chinese child uh, must compel to learn are one, feel the piety, honor the father, not so much the mother, but the male, the patriarchal. So in her life, she built a memorial hall for the father as well as a library that amassed volumes of Chinese classics as a Li Tao Memorial Library. And the second thing she talked about was the emperor, loyalty to the emperor as part of the filial piety. So her political um, point of view is somewhat consistent with Columbia at the time, uh, advocate for a constitutional type of monarchy rather than a totally uh, democratic sort of, uh, uh, you know, China. And she was concerned that China would, would descend into chaos. And history proved her right because there was no strong man to, to war off the fraction. And she identified herself in this poem as Chinese, Awake My Country, Sweet Cathay. Uh, the last uh, essay I want to share quickly is when she talked about women's suffrage, she has a slightly different version of what's called Chinese uh, uh, suffrage in which she emphasized economic empowerment beyond, above all others. And so this is an interesting reading. Uh, I did not, uh, so in some ways she, she took a slight at those women who marry into powerful family as a way to get on top. So it's a slight to these three daughters or six daughters of Hui Kin, in which she differed with Hui Kin. Hui Kin supported Sun Yat-sen's radical revolution. Mabel wanted this preservation of the emperor Bao Wang Hui as a reform rather than radical because she feels China has a certain kind of legacy. And so it's a slight again. Uh, here is a, another slice to the Sun sister who basically had married into fame and power. And in the last photograph here, Mabel is in the middle, again, surrounded by powerful men in Chinatown in 1950. Why? Because she donated out of her fortune $10,000 as well as donated volumes of Chinese classic that she was able to get from Hu Xi from Taiwan. And so Mabel played with the boys and they, she beat them. And as a result, she's able to acquire a very important property as part of the network of the church. Uh, Port Arthur, 79 March Street, with great and amazing history. And in her essay, I just want to close with this, that she basically emphasized the emperorship in her dissertation, the history of economic, but looking at the emperors, the, also the dynasty. And interestingly, in her, uh, in her uh, Chinese bibliography, she, she quoted a number of classics and I've been trying to understand it. At first, I have no idea what that is. This is written in 1921. Not too many people are interested. It doesn't look like it's been used that much. In the bibliography listed, San Hai Jing, Canon of Mountain and Sea. That's very interesting because currently the Chinese uh, government is using those texts to bring back this idea of the great China culture by looking at the mythology and all kinds of interesting tale they were only hear as a child. And here she quoted San Hai Jing that essentially uh, written by the uh, flood controller Dai Yu, Yu 
and it talks about the Chinese Adam and Eve, uh, <laughs> Fu Xi and Nui Hua. Wow, it's quite interesting. So I had an occasion to talk about her life in Beijing University, and very off campus, and she would be a rock star. Xi Jinping would love to read her political point of view and uh, the current interest in making China culture, bringing back to uh, the current, uh, uh, I guess, uh, conversation of what is, you know, what is China? What is China? Okay, now we'll end here. Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Bear Lee. That was really fascinating. Um, and our next speaker, I'm sure people have a lot of questions about that. Our next speaker, Professor Naidu, um, told me that he read Mabel's dissertation in preparation for this evening's talk. So I'm wow. going to hand it over to uh, Professor <coughs> Suresh Naidu. I mean, red is a strong, <laughs> I read, uh, uh, it was 450 pages. Um, uh, but but I, but I, I, I did want to sort of, you know, sort of highlight my comments um, just around sort of positioning this work in kind of economic history and just kind of giving a flavor of, of you know, the kind of work that was done at Columbia at the, um, at the time. And, you know, when, so I, I take the point that like, if you go through this, this book, it actually just looks endlessly, it's going through all the dynasties of China. And it's going through in particular talking about the agricultural system in each of these dynasties. And, you know, there's an enormous amount of intellectual work that goes into, so she, what, one of the things she does in the, in the appendices is she's calculating, she's getting estimates of kind of the distribution of land and the yields per acre for each of these dynasties. And so what is actually looks like a pretty like painful piece of work, it's super important because she's got to get the units of land right across these different measurement systems. And you can imagine, and so a lot of this appendix is basically, here's what a Mao is in this dynasty, here's what it is in this dynasty, let's make them harmonized into different units. And that's only, that's, it's only after you do that, that you can kind of get some sort of sense over the long historical trajectory of here's how much outputs per acre for like a standard unit of land are changing over time. Here's how the distribution of land is changing over time. And so she's doing all of this work kind of from all the original Chinese language sources. And, and, and part of the contribution I think of the work is actually making those sources legible and you know, to, to English language um, um, scholars. And so I just won't, you know, I, I don't wanna take up, take up too much time. I just sort of wanna stress that as something that economic historians, even today, those of you that have heard of like Thomas Piketty's work or, uh, uh, or, or something like that, it's really like the, Emphasis on getting historical measurement right is just something I think that goes all the way through economic history. It's that, you know, we're, it's, it's somewhat boring, but we kind of think that it's a huge amount of value in kind of making sure that you understand what each number means in this particular context and how it can be compared to the other numbers and other contexts and whether or not it's meaning, uh, whether or not it means the same thing. And, and I think uh, uh, Mabel Lee is doing some of that. And so, so the, the, the two points I thought I would, I would highlight from it is one of the things that I learned from it was just this oscillation between dynasties where you have like extensive private ownership of land and then other dynasties where you have central allocation of land and then it goes back to private ownership of land and then it goes back to central ownership. And so this kind of like uh, uh, oscillation between, um, you know, uh, centralized imperial land distribution and sort of more, more of the, the nobles and the latifundia system seems to be this like back and forth in, in Chinese history. And I can just can't help but think she's writing in the wake of like the Chinese Republican Revolution of 1911 and kind of thinking about, you know, that as just like the latest in kind of a long stream of these, of, of these, of these uh, revolutions. And then the, the, the last part, it was like, I'm like, why is she so interested in agriculture here? And I think it's that it's partly that, you know, one of the conceits that I think I have about economic history is that it's actually like social history at, at the kind of scale that you need to do it at because no, none of the regular peasants are leaving any written records of their own, but how you can get a sense of their lives is by looking at you know, grain yields and land, land distribution 
um, and, and things like that. And so if you were just writing a normal history of Chinese dynasties, you'd just be like, this political thing happened and this political thing happened and this political thing happened. And what Neva Lee is doing in her dissertations is instead sort of showing, well, the rise and fall of these different dynasties is like closely anchored to the performance of the agricultural system underneath that. So she's really kind of working with a, a materialist conception of history for, for, this, uh, uh, for the long, long period of Chinese uh, histories that she covers, like back to 2000 BC. And I think uh, that's, that's kind of a, you know, one way to think of what she's doing in, in, in kind of a modern lens is thinking she's trying to tell a story where the, the dynasties are not necessarily determined by the actions of the particular emperors uh, of the day, but it's actually it's like kind of uh, the, the, the economic structure and the, the, what she calls the like worms, wars, famines and floods kind of have a large uh, impact on, on, on Chinese political history also. So I'll leave it at that. That is really fascinating. And I have a lot to say about units of measure and history, but I'm gonna save it for later. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, our next speaker is um, Professor Kathleen Cahill uh, from Penn State. Thank you, May. And I'm going to also um, share some images. We have so many wonderful images um, of Mabel Lee. It's really exciting. So I'm just incredibly honored to be on this panel um, with all of these panelists who care so deeply about Mabel Lee. And I want to especially thank um, Dr. Nye and Dr. Shu and um, Pastor Lee and Robert Gee, who were so generous with me when I was starting my research um, on Mabel Lee. They all helped me. Um, so I'm going to focus today on her um, um, sort of experience with uh, the suffrage movement and her suffrage um, activism. And I first encountered her while I was looking through uh, newspaper databases, looking for stories about suffrage parades. And the 1912 New York City suffrage parade, as many of you know, um, is very well known. Um, it's known in suffrage histories for being the largest and mo most talked about um, suffrage parade up to that point. Um, and as I looked through the coverage of the papers, and you saw a preview of this in um, Pastor Lee's uh, slideshow, there are pictures of this young Chinese woman named Mabel Lee. They were all over the place. Um, they appeared in coverage kind of in the months leading up to the parade, um, in the reportage on the parade itself. Um, and it wasn't just New York papers. These were appearing across the country throughout the nation. And again, I knew this parade was important, um, but I had never heard of this young woman who sort of seemed to be really getting a lot more coverage than you would have expected for 1912, right? Um, as, as Pastor Lee mentioned, um, Black women who are in this parade are never named. In any of the newspaper reports that I could find, they were not named. Um, and there were very brief kind of mentions. She, on the other hand, right, um, her story is told, her name is there, her picture is there. So I wanted to know why she got this much attention and I wanted to know more about her. She seemed really interesting. And the answer to why she gets so much attention um, reminds us of the transnational nature of her suffrage activism as well as sort of suffrage conversations more broadly. Um, but so to understand her story, we have to understand that there were women's movements in the US but also in China. And as you heard, Mabel came to the United States um, when she was quite young, about five years old, traveling with her mother, Li Lai Beck, who was a teacher, and they were joining her father, Li Tao, who was a Baptist missionary worker. Um, and they were allowed to um, come to the United States, immigrate to the United States, because their uh, positions as teacher and minister fell under an, one of the very few exceptions to the um, Chinese Exclusion Acts. But um, those acts still said that um, immigrants from China could not become naturalized citizens of the United States. Which I think is interesting then about why she might be fighting for women's suffrage rights. So um, the press coverage around her began in earnest in 1912, in April um, of 1912, after a meeting between white uh, suffrage leaders and suffragists from Chinatown took place. Um, and this meeting included Anna Howard Shaw, she's the woman sitting um, beyond the podium, who's the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA, which is the biggest um, organization in the country, suffrage organization. 
And these pictures, again, circulate incredibly widely. So this version appeared in the Tampa Tribune, as you can see here, um, but it also appeared in the Asheville, North Carolina Gazette News, the Eugene, or Oregon Morning Register, and even in the Edmonton Journal from Alberta, Canada. So again, it begs the question of, right, why were Americans so interested? Well, um, again, sort of some, there have been some previews. In October of 1911, a few months before this parade, uh, the Republican revolutionary forces in China had overthrown the Qing dynasty, and by March 1912 had established the Republic of China. Um, and American papers were reporting on women's participation in this, especially as you see here, um, this women's brigade or these Chinese Amazons who fought in the revolution, but also women who had served as spies um, and were, they were also reporting on the new Republican government's support of women's rights, including the right to vote. Now, it was a lot more complicated than American papers were reporting, um, but what they were reporting was that women in, in um, China had gained the right to vote. And so um, it turned out also that that New York City meeting was not totally unique. There were um, several other meetings because white American suffragists wanted to learn more about what was happening in China. And they turned to the Chinese and Chinese American women in their cities, like Mabel Lee and her mother Lai Bet, um, and asked them what was going on. And these women were seemed happy to come and talk and teach uh, them about, um, again, kind of current events in China, but they also had a lot more to say. Um, I found at least four of these meetings um, in uh, New York City, the one we just mentioned, but also in Portland, Oregon, Cincinnati, Ohio, and Boston, Massachusetts. And the Chinese women seem to have accepted the invitations, again, because they gained an audience of these politically active, often well-connected um, white women, who, um, to whom they presented, again, this history, public events, or current events, but also the grievances that they had as immigrants in the United States, right? So they spoke out against the immigration, um, harsh immigration restrictions. They spoke out against um, the prejudice their communities encountered. Um, they spoke out against um, lack of educational opportunities. And it's really hard in this um, era for women of color to um, uh, control their images. But when the Chinese women were speaking here, they could choose how they were dressed. Um, you'll notice um, in the bottom picture, which is New York, uh, the woman on the left is Pearl Liu, who is described as wearing a smart sailor suit. Mabel and her mother, who are on the right, um, are wearing um, Chinese uh, clothing, more recognizably Chinese clothing. But um, again, both of uh, them were choosing how to present themselves. I think it's really interesting that in both Portland um, and New York, women brought young children, um, potentially suggesting that those, um, particularly the young girls, uh, had been born in the US and thus had birthright citizenship and could be potential future voters. So um, as I mentioned at the meeting, they give these speeches. Here's uh, the picture of Mabel giving the speech and you see to her right, her mother and father are on the stage with her supporting her again um, in this. Um, she is uh, again at this moment only 16 years old. She's a high school student um, and apparently it was very poised um, and very charismatic in her speaking, something that people would continue to say about her um, in the future. Um, so again, when she spoke and the other women spoke, they mentioned their pride in the Chinese um, Republic um, and its position on women's rights uh, that was ahead of the US and then called on white Americans to address the prejudice that, that Chinese and Chinese Americans um, faced. And these two things are related because stereotypical ideas about China as a backward nation were the reason that Americans gave for these um, restrictive immigration policies. So the women are really kind of attacking um, the root of those policies by celebrating what was happening in China. Um, so when she gives this speech and she focuses on educational equality and educational access for Chinese girls, but also for Chinese boys, um, Mabel really impressed these national leaders. And it seems that either at this meeting or soon after it, they asked her to, to join this, the upcoming suffrage parade that they were planning. And not just to march in it, but to ride in the opening cavalcade of 50 um, women who were leading the parade up 
uh, Fifth Avenue. Um, they, Mabel's mother and the other women um, from Chinatown were also going to participate in the parade and they marched carrying uh, the, the flag of the New Republic of China, but also banners that said things like light from China, which is a reversal of what US missionaries often said when they were right gathering uh, funds to, to go to China. So um, as I said, in, and you saw this picture, uh, reports of the parade highlight Mabel and you can see her on the horse there in the um, left. And um, there's a lot, there's pictures of her. There's also a lot of write up about her um, from this parade. And it's not just the newspapers themselves. Um, suffragists, white suffragists are also highlighting the um, participation of Chinese women. And here um, is the cover of the women's journal, which was NASA's um, main journal, it, this is the parade issue. So what they chose to focus on is Anna Howard Shaw, again, the president who's carrying this banner. And she had marched right behind the women from Chinatown with this banner that says, NASA catching up with China. So white American suffragists were um, sort of framing this as, this is something that is um, backwards, right? Chinese women shouldn't have more rights than white American women. And they were calling on white American men to sort of fix this reversal of fortunes. Um, so it, it really kind of others uh, the women in the parade and, and implies that, and many of them couldn't become US citizens, but it implies that they were really separate. They were Chinese women, not Chinese American women. Um, I want to emphasize, and I think Pastor Lee mentioned this too, right? Mabel Lee and her mother, this wasn't the first time they'd been, been politically active. They were doing all kinds of stuff in Chinatown, um, working in the mission, setting up kindergartens. Um, here, this play was um, for the YWCA, and it emphasized sort of um, the course of Chinese history. She's very interested in history, um, and it's up to its modern present. And they worked with the YWCA as well. Um, they raise famine funds, and her mother actually rides in one of the Chinatown parades to raise funds for, for the famine um, victims in China. So um, that fall, when Mabel enters uh, Barnard College in 1913, she continues her suffrage work. Um, oops, I'm going to come back to that one. Um, she clearly attends talks by suffrage speakers on campus. Uh, she joins the debate club um, and they debate the question of women's suffrage. She's in the YWCA. Um, she's constantly talking to her classmates at Barnard, um, particularly through the Y and emphasizing that um, they need to understand Chinese history, especially if they're going to work in missions in China. Um, white suffrage groups continue to ask her to speak uh, to them and let them know what's happening in China. And she works with them for the 1915 New York City uh, or New York State suffrage campaign, um, which fails, but she's part of it. She speaks at the suffrage shop on Fifth Avenue. She talks to reporters who interview her. And again, she's often sort of positioned by them as Chinese, right? Part of the worldwide movement for suffrage, not an American suffragist. Um, and so at the same time that she's doing that and she's, she's explaining Chinese women's rights activism to uh, white American suffragists, she also at Barnard and then again at Columbia um, puts most of her energy into the Chinese Student Association, Chinese Student Club, which we're gonna hear about from Dr. Xu. I just wanna say um, that what she focuses on there is also her suffrage activity. And you saw that Dr. Lee talked, or uh, Pastor Lee talked about her um, writings, it's no coincidence to me that she puts her, most of her writings about women's suffrage into the Chinese Students Monthly, that her audience for this argument are the future leaders of uh, the, the new Chinese nation um, and the business community that's sort of reading this um, English language uh, publication. She, in these articles, kind of draws on her experience from suffrage uh, in the United States and her history courses on US history um, and philosophy um, and, and uses it to then talk about how women's rights need to be part of the new nation from the beginning. She says, look at the example of England and the US who did not uh, build women's rights into their founding. Now they're going to have having to go back and retrofit. And in China, we can kind of do it from the beginning and we need to. And she talks about democracy as being, um, uh, feminism as being the application of democracy and equality to women. So um, 
I want to end kind of with 1917 and hand it on. But in 1917, of course, the New York State um, suffrage campaign has tried again, and they have been successful, and women win the right to vote in New York. But Mabel Lee, who is not a citizen, is not going to be able to participate. But as you heard, she um, is very interested in economics and women's um, sort of participation in uh, the, the, the professions, and she chooses to go to enter this PhD program at Columbia and, and study economics. And in this article that she wrote in 1914, she had said that feminism was equality of opportunity and that women were demonstrating that they could be equal in all fields, especially the prof prof uh, professions. And she writes about um, them as uh, the pioneers of today. And I would assert that it is in 1917 as she enters the PhD program in economics um, that she herself is becoming one of those pioneers um, doing something that very, very few women had done before her, Chinese or otherwise. So I'll um, end there. Thank you and uh, turn it over. Thank you so much, Professor Cahill. Um, we're learning so much about Mabel Lee tonight. Now, um, I received a text message from uh, Professor Xu saying her internet crashed. So I'm hoping that she was able to log on by her phone. Madeline, are you there? I don't know. We have some people who are here by phone, but I don't think she's on. Um, so we're gonna hopefully fix that and uh, we're gonna we're gonna then move to our Barnard colleagues uh, for your presentation, and we're gonna just move you up, um, and then we'll come back and hopefully uh, Professor Shu will be able to wrap things up for us. So thank you. Thank you for having us at this celebration. It is our pleasure to present our project, Encountering What Remains, Methodologies for Navigating the Archive. We began this project this past summer, beginning with simply encountering the archive in an effort to look for women of color at Barnard in the 20th century. We found that the presence of women of color within Barnard's archives were and, and are not prominent. So we had to think of creative ways of finding these women within the archive, which included searching a wide range of primary sources, including newspaper articles about Mabel Ping, Ping Hua Li and the Barner College Digital Archives. Um, we were confined to the digital collections because of pandemic restrictions. Within these archives, we focused on Barnard yearbooks for names and images, and we battled with the subject of race. We did not want to subscribe to racial science by trying to identify non-white women based on phenotypes in their yearbook photos. We also used two past student projects, Black at Barnard by Corinth Jackson and Rimming at Barnard by Maya Garfinkel. Additionally, we relied on contemporary and outdated and derogatory search terms relating to race. And finally, we looked at New York City area archives, finding remnants of racial history that were not present, present in Barnard's digital archives, such as students in blackface. These discoveries led us to drastically changing our project focus, and we realized we had to shift to a more theoretical and methodological project because of the absences and omittances in archives, um, and also to the trouble of reading race within the archives. The question of women of color at Barnard in the early 1900s. As a category of identification, women of color is not a viable category. This term flattens heterogeneous groups of women into a singular group, effectively erasing differences across women's lived experiences and reducing experience to a monolith. As a form of identification, women of color is a Western construction that racializes non-white women. It is also a construction that is relatively foreign to women born outside the US or the West more broadly. Racism and racialization operate differently in the United States and in other Western countries than they do elsewhere or in regions that are more racially homogenous. Histories of immigration in the US demonstrate immigrant experience produces a unique othering that differentiates women of color born outside the US from women of color born in the US. 
Chandra Mohanty and Jackie Alexander write, as immigrant women of color, we are neither the right color, gender, or nationality in terms of the self-definition of the US Academy or by extension of the women's studies establishment. In women's studies contexts, the colors of our gender mattered. The citizenship machinery deployed by the state, which positioned us as resident aliens, deviant non-citizen legal immigrants, operates similarly within women's studies. It codifies an outsider status, which is different from the outsider status of women of color born in the United States. However, the specificities of our national and cultural genealogies being black and brown women and our statuses as immigrants were constantly being used to position us as foreign thus muting the legitimacy of our claims to the experience of different racisms, end quote. This outsider status is so important to understanding the production of gender and racialization as both fluid and permeable categories that reproduce and produce one another to inform one another as well. Furthermore, the women of color that are fo the focus of this project are immigrant women. Their immigrant identity is inseparable from understanding the racialization and gendering. For example, Consider the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned the immigration of Chinese laborers. Relations of power are fundamental here. Colonization, Christianity, and whiteness were all significant factors in Mabel's family's existence in the US after the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed at the turn of the 20th century. Here, we're inching towards the notion that whiteness is not only about skin color, it's about access and resources. We're thinking in terms of whiteness as capital. Solby will be elaborating on relations of power and the dimensions of colonization, religion, and education. To reiterate, we cannot approach race as an isolated category if we want to discover the experiences of women of color at Barnard. Race is continuously reproduced and an unstable category of identity. We created a framework that accounts for the overlapping and interlocking experiences that also highlights key differences in experience. Kayla will be discussing our framework. Our web-like framework brings focus to the relationships and tensions between these social elements and how they work together to contextualize why and how these students came to be students at Barnard. Our framework reflects our research process. As we began solely using race to guide our archival research, the student discovered that the entanglements between gender, race, religion, US colonial, and US colonial hege hegemony had to be at the center of our methodology. These were some, but possibly not all, of the social elements that we found significant in researching Mabel Lee and other non-white students in Barnard's archives. For example, we first approached the history of Barnard. Here's a quote from Maya Garfinkel's source, Rooming at Barnard, on-campus housing and conceptions of safety. Quote, the founders and early leaders envisioned establishing Barnard as an institution for the wealthier Anglo-Saxon elite and the dormitory's feminized space of home assisted in recovering the white woman's femininity in her pursuit of higher education, end quote. It's clear that Barnard worked to cultivate, impose, and celebrate aspects of white femininity. We found that non-white women were both rejected by and had to adhere to Barnard's imposition of white femininity. More specifically, as Ellie explained earlier, they had whiteness in form of other resources and capital in order to be at Barnard. We soon found that the non-white students had access to Barnard um, through whiteness as capital, as it relates to class, race, religion, and US colonial hegemony. Wealthier non-white students were able to attend Barnard, such as black students whose families were considered the black elite and whose lighter complexions afforded them the ability to pass as white. And as Sylvie will discuss, four Chinese students whose families were heavily involved with Christianity and missionary work and the United States utilization of this missionary work for colonization. As Kayla mentioned, we developed this framework out of our research in an attempt to connect together different subjects and contextualize their studies at Barnard. In the college's archives, we found remnants of records for four Asian students at Barnard during the 1900s and 1910s. And we wanted to understand what kinds of connections and differences existed across these students and the circumstances of their admittance when immigration law and the entire legal ecosystem of the United States was being encoded with anti-Asian ideology. With the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Page Act being enforced, we wondered how these students came to be students at Barnard and what their lives might have been like. 
Our framework helps to examine how these students and the existence of non-white students at Barnard in general are made legible or not through archival documentation. For example, threading together religion, specifically Christianity, and processes of racialization, we were able to find records for student life activity. For example, Anna Fojin Kong, who graduated in 1915, acted as secretary of Barnard's Young Women's Christian Association. And her religious commitments help mark her and allow her to be recorded, enhancing her archival subjectivity and rendering her faith as a readable aspect of her life. It is also important to trace this archival record to broader historical conditions, such as the Boxer Rebellion and then the US-China negotiations for Chinese students that came out of this period. This framework orients our research and offers context for academia as a site of colonial brokerings between the US and China based on faith, among other things. Some of our conclusions are that there really is no uniform scope with which to examine this historical period or any, as well as the archival materials. And women of color end up obscuring important material differences between these groups of women that hugely impacted their lived experiences. And our analytical framework helps to embrace the scattered social elements that shape these students' histories and their archival presence, as well as mirroring the fragmented materials of what remains in Barnard's and other archives. Thus, we are able to address issues of legibility and invisibility for different racialized subjects. And thinking ahead, the as Ellie mentioned before, the processes of racialization that Mohanty and Alexander were describing in relation to women's studies work equally as well as the description of racialization that operates in women's colleges. Racialization processes that are part of who was and is legible as a woman and therefore properly present in the space of a women's college. Drawing on Mohanty and Alexander as well as our own framework, we will be returning to the archives in the months ahead to understand how to develop methodological practices for other students and researchers navigating the archives. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much, um, all of you from Barnard. That is a tremendous amount of work and thinking that you did. And I think we all learned a lot from your um, your theorizing and your methodological approach. Okay, we are still trying to get Madeline on. Um, she's trying to get on through her phone. Um, Kay, do we have any luck with this? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, we're gonna, um, uh, I told her, <laughs> I told her to go back to the audience. She couldn't get on as a panel. I told her to go back to the audience and then Kay, you could, um, uh, you said you could promote her to panelists. We think she's in the audience. Madeline, are you in the audience as a 212 number? I'm going to try promoting you. She was in the Q and A also. All right, thank you everybody for standing by. Well, I'm really eager to hear what she has to say about the Chinese Student Alliance, which we had a little taste of that with their meetings at Cornell, right? That was um, the sponsor of that, that, that uh, wonderful photograph that Pastor Lee showed of them at Cornell. And it was very active uh, across the country, but especially at Columbia. Columbia was a real center for Chinese foreign students starting in this period and even earlier and going all the way up through uh, World War II era. So um, it has a wonderful history and we're trying to get Madeline on. Okay, let's see. Um, maybe as we wait, we can, um, talk about, uh, answer some of the questions um, while we wait for her. Um, we have a question for, um, from Victor Huey, um, and maybe, maybe Pastor Lee can answer this. He says, Mabel Lee was a pioneer, 
a woman who lived in Chinatown during the bachelor times when women were excluded by the Chinese exclusion laws. How did she navigate and negotiate a peace at a time when warring clans were fighting each other to survive? Okay, that's kind of two questions, right? How did she, how was she able to immigrate under, under the exclusion laws? And then how did she navigate the politics of China in the early Republican period? Um, Pastor Lee, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, well, I think uh, in terms of exclusion, we have to look at the early days when uh, people like individual like Yong Wang, who was uh, able to come and there was a, basically a strategy from the Western Christian community to bring young you know, convert right through this uh, me. But the Qing dynasty, the government put a stop to it because they were coming from the Southern part of China uh, where, you know, and they were right because uh, they came from the same place, Zhongshan, where Sun Yat-sen came from. So the Qing government was somewhat paranoid that these overseas Chinese students would align themselves with the West. So they put a stop to it just before the uh, 1882 Exclusion Act. So there was a sort of reciprocity process that hasn't been examined. Now, so, uh, so missionary and uh, had a first dip Right, Christians, because uh, at that time, American was essentially Christian, whether it's liberal, politicized more than the fundamentalist camp, but so uh, 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 helpful treatment. Uh, I don't know how long I could go into it, but if, interestingly, her mother, Mabel's mother was the first to be educated because of a missionary uh, named uh, Roswell Grave, he started visitation to the women in the homes. So she was more educated than Li Tao. Li Tao came when he was like 12 years old. He's like me, you know. Uh, he didn't know Chinese that well. He didn't know English that well. So he went back to China. So it turned out that the women, because of the missionary outreach, had were able to access, you know, this this uh, this track. Uh, for, so there was no exclusion if you're a Christian. Uh, so that's I don't know if that's the first answer. Mabel was not that involved in the uh, Tang War. It was her father in 1924, where he held a peace conference among the triad, Hip Sing, An Liang, and he was uh, stricken with paralysis because he was treated badly. They basically said, sit down, you know, Bible man, what do you know about conflict? So Mabel was uh, uh, uptown, you know, studying. So uh, she didn't get back to Chinatown until her father passed away. And so during the, uh, uh, during the 30s, late 20s and 30s, she brought a lot of students, probably from Teachers College, right, to help teach English. I think at that time before the World War II, most students were thinking about going back to China before. So they were in some way training Chinese to go back to, to their own country at that time. So uh, I don't think Mabel was that involved in the, uh, the Tang War uh, because she's a woman, right? Right, right. Well, her father was the, was the de facto mayor of Chinatown because he was uh, chosen as Lin Sing so to be the president of the Chinese Benevolent Association. So he was a de facto mayor. He, that was part of his work to, to you know, to, bring harmony to the community, but Maple didn't have that role. Right. I, I want to um, build on something that Professor Naidu had mentioned about the, the quality of her dissertation, the uh, kind of painstaking research that was required for her to um, uh, actually compare across dynasties. You have to have the, a comparable unit of measure in order to compare. But um, what what strikes me is something that Pastor Lee mentioned in passing was that she had planned to go back to China, um, but she stayed in the United States after her father died in order to take over responsibility in the church. And um, she was very close to Hu Shi, who was um, a student at Columbia who studied with Dewey. And, you know, Hu Shi would go back to China and be its number one um, intellectual and philosopher during the interwar years. And so she was very close to Hu Shi at Columbia. And he apparently really encouraged her um, 
to use her education and her knowledge to help build the Republic. And that was the call at the time for all these students who had gone to the West under the boxer scholarships was to go back to China and build the Republic. And she was taking up that call and then she decided not to do it uh, so she could support her father's church. But I think it's remarkable that as a woman, she was so highly educated um, and had so much to contribute. Um, and at this time, there's also a debate going on about um, what should be the role of Western science in China. There were, there were um, I have there's a PhD student in the audience who's writing a dissertation about the China Foundation. And these um, American philanthropists, including Paul Monroe at Teachers College, um, debated what should the boxer indemnity money support? Should it support pure scientific research or should it support um, applied science, uh, including um, agricultural technologies and things like this? And this is a really important debate because I think it, it highlights how the West um, had different views about China. Is China capable of, of pure science? or do we need to just send in some engineers, right? Uh, and this is something that I think, you know, we can hear echoed um, today in the role of China and scientific, the production of scientific knowledge um, uh, in the world. Okay, so I think Madeline Xu is, uh, I'm not able to connect securely to the server, so she cannot log back on. So is that gonna be it? So not possible, I'm texting her, I'm sorry. We are a little over time and, um, and I'm really sorry that we didn't have her presentation because she has written about the Chinese Students Alliance in her book, um, The Good Immigrants. And I think she has a lot more to share with us about uh, that experience of Chinese international students at Columbia. And we have many Chinese international students at Columbia today. They are a huge population on our campus. I think their presence is um, sometimes controversial um, in terms of, uh, you know, um, there, there are a lot of paying students uh, who, who uh, get master's degrees here. The university benefits financially from their presence. Um, and that's somewhat controversial in terms of, you know, what kind of educational institution, you know, are we running? Um, but Chinese students, again, are a big presence on our campus. Um, and they are, they are my students, they're our students, they're part of our community. Um, and we have a lot to do also in terms of how we uh, teach them, how we work with them, um, and what their interests are. A lot of them want to go back to China and a lot of them don't. And so they're not a monolithic group. And I think um, I really appreciate uh, Pastor Lee's remarks that Mabel was a complicated person as we all are complicated people. And I think her life and those contradictions um, bear uh, thinking about uh, even for our own time. So I'm really, really sorry that um, Professor Shu's internet dropped out. Um, I recommend her book to all of you. Uh, I don't think she's talked specifically about Mabel Lee in her book, but it's a really, uh, important work about uh, Chinese intellectuals and Chinese students in the United States, starting from the time of the Boxer scholarships all the way up to the present day. So um, I regret that uh, we had that little snafu with her internet and thank you for your patience. Um, we, had, we had a great turnout tonight and I hope you um, enjoyed and learned from the program. I certainly did. So thank you and good night.